So welcome to our first event of this General Assembly, um, as well as our first hybrid event that we're holding as the NGO Committee on the Family at the United Nations in New York. Uh, my name is Ryan Coe, and I am the co-chair of the committee. Benjamin Freer, who is my other co-chair, is present with us in person in the room. Um, and it's exciting. And we welcome the other members of the board that we have with us today. Uh, Lynn Walsh, Marsha Barlow, Siobhan Heakin Kennedy, right? Did I say that last name right? Uh, close enough. Heakin Kennedy. Okay. Heakin Kennedy, um, as well as Florence Denmark is also on the line. Uh, Vinny Santoro is also with us. Um, and just this great, great panel that, or great, great board that we have and that we have to work with. Um, we are excited for this first event. We're excited to have some people in person. And as the year goes by, um, depending on the COVID situation, uh, we should be able to do more hybrid events like this. Um, I was telling the group that one of the big advantages is that we can have some of us meet in person while at the same time we can have our speakers come um, from different places. Um, and our speakers today are coming in from Texas, from Montreal, and from right here in New York City. Um, the theme of today's event is exploring fertility trends, family dynamics, and solutions. And we have a great panel assembled. I'll briefly introduce the speakers, and then I will put longer versions of their bios in the chat for everybody to read, should you be interested in that. So our first speaker today will be Ambassador Susanna Horvath, who is the permanent representative of Hungary to the United Nations. For those of you who are long-term supporters and or members of the committee, you know that we've had a good working relationship with the mission of Hungary over the years, and we're excited to, to continue that relationship with Ambassador Horvath. Um, after she gives some opening remarks, uh, then we'll turn the time over to Dr. Valerie Hudson, who is a university distinguished professor of the Department of International Affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University and the founder of the Women's Stats Project, Women's Stats Project, and Mr. Lyman Stone, who is the Director of Research, Demographic Intelligence, and a Research Fellow at the Institute for Family Studies and an Adjunct Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, in other words, these people know their stuff and we're excited to learn from them today. Uh, so first of all, I'll turn the time over to Ambassador Horvath for some opening remarks. Please, Ambassador. Well, um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having me, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to start by saying that uh, uh, how grateful I am uh, for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share with you the experience and the best practices of the government of Hungary on the important topic of today's discussion, global fertility trends and family policies. Today, we think that one of the largest demographic challenges in Europe and many developed countries is population aging and the decreasing number of births. This trend does not only threaten the future economies of our countries, but also poses an existential challenge to our nation. According to our research, those in childbearing age in Hungary would like to have two to three children on average. However, the actual fertility rate was only 1.25 10 years ago, which means that many couples wanting to have children were not able to fulfill their aspirations. Therefore, the overarching aim for the government is to reach the ideal 2.1 fertility rate by 2030. To this end, the Hungarian government set the ambitious goal of reversing the demographic trends and committed to an unprecedented level of support for families to achieve this goal. The guiding principles of the policy is based on the following four pillars. The first pillar is to increase financial support to young married couples and families raising children in order to enable couples to have as many children as they desire without fear of financial hardship. 
The second pillar is strengthening public services, supporting families, such as paid parental leave, job protection for parents on parental leave, and support for their return to the labor market, as well as quality, flexible, and free childcare. The third pillar is encourage marriage and childbirth with a value-based pro-family public policy. And the fourth pillar is providing more freedom for families to choose whether to stay at home to raise kids or return to the labor market. They are supported in both options. The results achieved through this policy only in the past 10 years since 2010 are outstanding. The fertility rate, for example, increased from 1.25 in 2010 to 1.55, which is the highest volume since 1996. It means that Hungarian families welcome 115,000 more newborns. The number of children born in wedlock increased from 52% to 61%. The number of abortions in the meantime decreased to almost half without any change in the abortion policies in the country. This means that more families decided to raise children due to the support offered for this important endeavor. The number of marriages also doubled and the number of divorces decreased by 40%. And lastly, female employment increased from 55% to over 72%. So how, how could we achieve these unprecedented results? The government more than doubled the financial resources spent on family policy, which is currently approximately 5% of the country's GDP, roughly twice the OECD average. First, we provide real choices for young parents, mothers in particular, so that they can stay at home with their babies even for three years if they wish to do so, and they will receive maternity support or return to the labor market part-time or full-time and place their children in publicly financed, available and high quality nurseries. By supporting mothers in their choice, Hungary sends the key message that motherhood is a value for the entire society. Second, in terms of childcare allowances, the infant care allowance is offered for half a year after childbirth amounting to 100% of the salary earned prior to the child was born without any cap and with more favorable taxation. Therefore, mothers giving birth will be in a better financial situation as before. Afterwards, until the child reaches the age of two, mothers are eligible for childcare allowance which amounts to 70% of the previous salary and a monthly childcare benefit until the child reaches the age of three. Moreover, if parents take up employment full-time or part-time when their child becomes six months old, they do not lose their eligibility for childcare allowance. This serves to support reintegration into the labor market. And if grandparents undertake to care for their grandchild at home instead of the parents who work, they are also eligible for childcare allowance. The government also supports families through subsidized loans and tax breaks. Young married couples, for example, are eligible for an interest-free loan of maximum 35,000 US dollars. The repayment will be suspended for three years at the birth of the, of the first child, for another three years at the birth of the second child, and the entire remaining amount will be released 
at the birth of the third child. Families also receive that relief for mortgages after the birth of their second child and further children. In addition, parents can reduce their personal income tax based on the number of children. Since last year, mothers with four or more children are exempted from paying any personal income tax throughout their career. The government also introduced generous housing subsidy for young married couples and families with children. What is more, the state reduces the student loans of mothers by, by 50% at the birth of their second child and takes over the redemption of the entire outstanding amount at the arrival of their third child. These are only a few specific examples on how the Hungarian government supports families in their desire to have and raise children and worse to reverse the demographic trends. As you see, this requires comprehensive policies and significant commitment, but our efforts are already bearing fruit and we are happy to support other countries and societies by sharing our experiences. I thank you once again for the opportunity to be with you today, and I look forward to working with you in the future, and thank you for the distinguished attention. And, uh, thank you very, very much, Ambassador Horvath, for your remarks. If I may, I know that you don't have time for general Q&A, but I have one quick question for you, a clarifying point. Um, yeah. The statistic that you cited that surprised me out of all of the, the, the benefits that you've seen from your child policies was that the women in the workforce has increased from 55 to 70 something percent. Um, 72, and I noticed, yes. 72, and I noticed that Lynn also raised her eyebrows at that. How have these policies contributed because these policies seem very uh, encouraging of women to stay at home with their kids, how how have it how has it actually contributed to more women in the workforce? What what's the underlying factor behind that? Because um, um, as uh, as I told that we have uh, uh, targeted subsidies, so uh, no matter if you uh, choose to stay at home with your uh, children with your baby or uh, choose to go back to work you get the, um, the allowances um, uh, no matter what you choose. So it means that you can work and get the, uh, the allowances after your children. So you will have both. Okay. You will have salary and you will have childcare allowances at the same time. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you very much for your remarks today. Um, once again, we appreciate our cooperation with the mission of Hungary. Um, for everybody else, Ambassador Horvath does have another engagement, so she does have to sign off. Um, but we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and so with that, we'll turn the time over to Dr. Hudson, um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much, Ryan. I found the ambassador's remarks absolutely fascinating, and I'm very glad that you've uh, recorded them. Um, and I hope you'll send us all a link because I'd like to um, to look again at the panoply of um, support for maternity that exists in Hungary. I think that's really outstanding. Um, and thinking about the theme of my remarks today, um, I think it's about babies and babies and whether those babies are girls or boys uh, and actually represents one of the most important determinants of geopolitics. Um, I'm a political scientist and international affairs specialist and um, am often called upon to uh, research and study issues of war and peace. And as I've gotten older, I've decided that babies are one of the most important determinants of war and peace. Well, to set the stage for my remarks, let's kind of look over the history of humankind. Um, throughout most of human history, population grew relatively slowly. Uh, there were a 
abundant sources of death and um, very little means to stave those off, such as antibiotics and other types of, of uh, treatments that we have. We then went through an aberrant period of great population growth uh, as death rates fell due to um, stunning advancements in military, um, uh, excuse me, medical technology. But I think we are, are now in perhaps an even more remarkable, even revolutionary stage where um, death rates have not plummeted further. But what we're seeing is that birth rates are dropping significantly. Um, as I was reviewing the figures on birth rates last night, um, we have about 95 nations that have replacement or above replacement birth rates in the world. And we have 132 nations that have sub replacement birth rates now. And so that means that we actually have more nations of the world that have sub replacement birth rates than have um, replacement or above replacement birth rates. The world estimate is uh, a birth rate of 2.42 uh, uh, children. Per, uh, per woman. Uh, and this means, uh, since the replacement rate is 2.1, that uh, we're once again in a situation where population is uh, rising uh, comparatively slowly to what it has in the past, at least in a global sense. However, there's great regional variation. Sub-Saharan Africa, the Arab world and the Middle East, North Africa region more generally uh, are increasing in population. South Asia, interestingly enough, is at about the world average, about 2.4. But every other region of the world is decidedly in the sub-replacement birth rate range. That includes Latin America, which many people don't think of as uh, being a continent with sub-replacement birth rates. East Asia, Europe, Central Asia, and North America, all of these regions have sub-replacement birth rates. Uh, from my point of view as an international affairs uh, scholar, uh, one of the interesting things to consider is that all the great powers or would-be great powers of our world are sub-replacement. So the US is 1.84, China and Russia are 1.6, and the EU is 1.62. So all of our great powers are now in population uh, decline. Even regional rivalries um, are characterized by nations that now have declining populations. So when we think of the Middle East, we might think of the, the big regional players as being say Iran and Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Well, Iran, Turkey and Saudi Arabia all have sub-replacement birth rates. Consider uh, the rising rivalry between the US and China. Um, in addition to the birth rates of China and the US themselves, it's interesting to look at the birth rates of the US's allies in East Asia. Interestingly, Taiwan has the lowest birth rate in the world, 1.07. South Korea is only 1.09. Japan, 1.38. And Australia and New Zealand in the 1.7 to 1.8 range. Um, so, it's fascinating to begin to think about what the ramifications for geopolitical conflict will be uh, of these facts. Now, layered, if you will, on top of the birth rate situation are abnormal sex ratios in some cases. Um, the US has a normal sex ratio, but Russia has a significantly abnormal sex ratio favoring females. Uh, China and India, I'm sure as you know, have significantly more men than women. And countries with um, 
too few women proportionately, will see their populations contract at a steeper rate because there are proportionately fewer potential mothers uh, in, um, in their subpopulations of childbearing age. Consider also that while the richest countries in the world have tried to get their birth rates to be at least at the replacement rate, to date, and with all due respect to the ambassador um, of, of, from Hungary, uh, whose description of their valiant efforts is really, really uh, remarkable. To date, all of these countries have failed, right? No country that's attempted to um, come back to a replacement rate from having a sub-replacement rate has succeeded in that quest. So even very generous support for maternity, for example, in the Nordic countries, such as Norway and Sweden, have yielded birth rates of only 1.84 and 1.86, respectively. And we heard from the ambassador that, that over a decade, they've gone from 1.25 to 1.55, which while extraordinary and, and very welcome, I'm sure uh, in Hungary, uh, is also not very near uh, the replacement rate of 2.1. So for me, this is all very stunning, especially considering as the ambassador pointed out that most women in at least Western nations who were surveyed about how many children they wanted to have admitted that they wanted more children than they did have, right? So this is very interesting as well that there is actually a desire on the part of women to have more children uh, but they feel that they cannot. In fact, the only places where women are having many children are in the very poorest countries where women have the fewest rights. Uh, Niger boasts the highest birth rate at 6.91 in the world. Now, there are many, many ramifications of these demographic megatrends. We don't have the time to discuss them all, though I wish we did. One, uh, which I wish we could focus on, but I probably won't uh, in these short remarks, is what all this says about male-female relations in the 21st century. Women, uh, given a free choice, um, are choosing, despite their own desires, not to perpetuate the cultures in which they live. And this can be said across many regions of the world. With that choice, many uh, once burgeoning nations, powerful nations, are literally whistling past the graveyard, as Russia is. I once stumbled across a website that predicted on the basis of mathematical modeling when the Jap last Japanese person in the world would die. And it was predicted that the date would be early in the next century. So we're, we're talking literally about the possibility of certain nations, certain ethnicities um, dying out. But today in the few minutes that I have remaining, I'd like to concentrate um, on more conventional geopolitical foci concerning matters of war and peace. Uh, to do that, I will probably focus on one country as a mini case study, and that would be China. China is currently reaching for its moment in the sun. Uh, and yet, as we've just noticed, it has a sub-replacement birth rate and it has a seriously abnormal sex ratio favoring males. China, excuse me, in essence is becoming year by year, increasingly older and more male. How will that affect the rise of China? Well, it's very interesting to consider that no nation in world history has ever achieved the status of world power with a sub-replacement birth rate and a declining population. Right at the historical moment when China should be reaching out to grasp the brass ring, its working age and military age population is shrinking. 
China has already raised the retirement age in an effort to mitigate this decrease in working population. Given cur current birth rates, that working age cohort will continue to shrink for the next quarter century at a minimum at the rain, range of about 0.5% uh, per year. The median age of a Chinese citizen is now almost 40. Some scholars have estimated that the total fertility rate of China is not actually 1.6, but is closer to 1.0. And the Financial Times has recently claimed that the Chinese population has decreased for the first time since the disastrous leap forward of the 60s. As someone who has studied Chinese demography for decades, uh, we have seen China move to a three plus child policy, all within the space of a very few years. Um, and in fact, offering to waive any birth um, policy uh, violation fines for couples. I am skeptical that this will be sufficient to raise the fertility rate to the level desired by the state. In fact, I am so skeptical that I would not be surprised in the least if within the near future, China actually imposes a birth quota of two or three children per couple. Now, it's uh, important to remember, as I've said before, that this population decline is accompanied by abnormal um, sex ratios. Uh, even to this day, uh, despite the fact that um, the abnormality in birth sex ratios has decreased since 10 years ago, 10 years ago, about 122 boy babies were born for every 100 girl babies in China. Uh, the figure is now approximately 111 or 112 boy babies being born for every 100 girl babies in China. Uh, and so um, scholars at Renmin University have projected that about 18% of China's young men born since 2015 will not be able to find brides in China. And the percentage is actually higher for those who were born before 2015. So kind of stepping back and looking at all of this, it's almost certain that because of population decline, uh, China is going to face economic stagnation. Declining work age populations are a drag on economic growth. And scholars note that China's growth rate has dropped fairly significantly. So 10 years ago, it was close to 10% per annum. Now, uh, pre-COVID, right, so that we're comparing apples with air apples, it was about 6%. Consumption patterns between uh, workers and the elderly are quite different also, with the elderly consuming much less than workers especially in the area of durable goods, um, with the exception being healthcare. Aging societies also have significantly lower savings rates as the elderly must divest themselves of their assets to maintain their standard of living in a context of rising health care costs. As a result, capital investment by China, both at home and abroad, may be compromised due to these demographic trends. Businesses may experience a um, significantly lower return on investment in their homeland, but increasing investment abroad may lead to a net capital outflow, which may result in the weakening of the currency of China. The lack of savings may cause interest rates to rise as well in that nation. Now, again, from the point of view of someone who studies war and peace, economic slowdowns are almost as a rule accompanied by significant domestic unrest. Furthermore, a society with a masculinized young adult population, such as China's, uh, is likely to respond to significant economic hardship with significant domestic instability and crime. I believe the Chinese regime will be hard pressed to maintain its usual level of control over society as a result. 
And we've seen an increasingly authoritarian turn with massive amounts of surveillance, facial recognition software, uh, and a social credit system, which I think is um, preparations that the Chinese state has made for this inevitable uh, outcome. The question for the government will be, how can it attract the allegiance of its highly masculinized population and channel uh, their grievances less inward and more outward? And I think the card of nationalism is the card that is usually played by a nation finding itself in such circumstances. And I think we have certainly seen an increasingly nationalist rhetoric and actions um, from the Chinese state. It may be that the Chinese government would be able to play upon these nationalist themes to maintain power in the context of an aging, more masculine society experiencing significant economic slowdown. Faced with worsening instability at home and an unsolvable economic decline, I think China's government may well be tempted to use foreign policy uh, to ride out domestic instability. Domestic instability um, may be seen in the near future by the government as much more threatening than the forces of international conflict. The government may search for contests of national pride, which would be highly attractive to its mas masculinized population. In addition, China may have calculated that its moment in the sun will be short due to these demographic and economic challenges, and that China will need to accomplish its nationalist aims now for perhaps in the near future, they may be further out of reach. The reunification of Taiwan may thus be on the front burner for the Chinese regime and not on the back burner for all of these reasons. The government may see a way to kill two birds with one stone, seizing a greater share of international power through successful international use of force while also appeasing forces of discontent at home. Masculinized societies are very susceptible to political campaigns stressing national pride vis-a-vis -vis competing nations. But masculinized societies are a real double-edged sword in this as well. For if the government is perceived as weak or as unsuccessful in these contests of national pride, it will be very vulnerable to internal dissension that would bring a stronger government to power. Perhaps this explains the tough bordering on bellicose rhetoric we have recently seen from the wolf warrior diplomats of the Chinese state. In some then, China's contempt for its daughters and its contempt for motherhood may have led it in the present time to a less stable, less prosperous China, and perhaps even a frustration of its international strategic aspirations. That would certainly be karma indeed. To conclude then, babies, and whether those babies are boys or girls, will strongly shape the future of many regional and even global contests of geopolitical power. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hudson. That was absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And um, as Lyman is getting ready to, to prepare his remarks um, or to present his remarks, can I just ask one question quickly? Um, and that is going back to Russia. So we talked about China a lot, but you said that the sex demographics or the, the demographics between the sexes in Russia are skewed towards females. And we can understand like China with a one child policy and you know wanting to have a male heir, et cetera, you know, and all the issues surrounding that. We we can see how that could skew male in in China, but why is it skewing female in Russia? That's an excellent question. And I can assure you it's not because anyone is practicing male infanticide or sex selective abortion against males. That's not what's happening. 
What's happening in Russia and actually several of the bordering nations like Belarus and Ukraine uh, is that they have extraordinarily high rates of young adult male um, uh, death, uh, mortality. Uh, in fact, I was once talking with Nick Eberstadt, whom uh, Lyman may know, and he said that the young adult male death rate in Russia now resembles what it did in the 1600s in Russia. Uh, and so this is from a um, wide variety of, of, of um, reasons, uh, but mostly involves substance abuse, alcoholism, uh, drug resistant TB um, that attend this and even um, freezing because those who abuse drugs and alcohol uh, in the winter time may find themselves outside and um, end up frozen to death, which thing I had not really considered as someone who lives in Texas. Yeah. So freezing is actually a high on the list of causes of death, uh, but it's freezing while drunk or freezing while stoned. <laughs> I, uh, that, that's really interesting. So I lived for a time, I was a foreign service officer and two years of my career were in Kiev. Um, and to just to get to work, I passed through this park and I've never seen um, that many drunk people that early in the day um, as I did when I was in Kiev. So that's really interesting that you bring that up. Um, so we're not going to get into a whole long discussion. We will have more Q&A afterwards. And just as a reminder to everybody, um, if you do have questions and you're not physically present in this room, please put your questions in the chat um, and we'll moderate those questions uh, after our next speaker. Um, and so our next speaker is Lyman Stone. Lyman has a PowerPoint, so he's gonna share his screen um, and show us that PowerPoint at the same time and take it away. Thanks very much. Um, it's an honor to uh, get to be part of this event um, and share the stage with uh, some very smart and interesting people. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll get right to it here. Um, give me a moment to uh, pull up my, my PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so I do have PowerPoint. I, uh, I can't keep my thoughts collected without, um, without something to work through. That's, that's an uh, admirable skill that, uh, that Dr. Hudson has, that she can, uh, she can work without a visual aid. Um, I can't. Uh, so I'm uh, going to talk about uh, family um, and fertility and childbearing, but I'm going to start by talking about um, uh, by talking about desire, things people want. So, uh, oops. PowerPoint is progressing. There we go. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm. I want to talk about what people want, about desires, about what it can tell us about family policy. So the big question that we want to ask is, uh, as as was laid out in the prior presentation, birth rates are pretty low in a lot of places. Um, people are having a lot fewer kids than they used to have, and in, in, in particularly in rich countries, they're not having enough kids for population stability. So why do we care? Why is this a problem? Uh, is it really a big deal if we have fewer people? Um, now, I think many people probably see some answer to this question is very obvious, right? It's, it's obvious why we should care about this because some reason. But what I wanna first argue is actually people give a lot of different reasons for why this might be a problem and they're not all compatible. Um, and in fact, I really appreciated the, the presentation uh, at the beginning that we had um, from the ambassador because she laid out actually quite a few different reasons why this might be a problem. So the first set of reasons that she laid out um, is basically for the economy. We need babies for the economy, right? Concerns like an aging workforce. We don't have enough babies. And so the workforce is gonna get old, less productive. Um, this will have consequences for all sorts of income related factors. 
or maybe um, older populations are less entrepreneurial and innovative, and so we'll have a less dynamic society and more inequality and intergenerational stagnation and things like that. Or maybe the problem is just that intergenerational transfers like social security systems or pensions will become unsustainable. So one set of arguments is birth rates are a problem because they're bad for the economy. Um, so we can kind of call this, um, uh, we can call this a liberal collectivist perspective or even a neoliberal perspective on why birth rates uh, are too low or what the problem is with low birth rates. Another one is that is for the nation. Why do you have babies? It's not for the economy, it's for the people, for a community, because it's important to perpetuate a nation or a religious community or a family lineage or an ethnic or cultural group. That is that being part of this cultural group is important and it's valuable and so it should be perpetuated. So this is a second set of arguments. Um, this argument, uh, this, this gets labeled lots of different things. I prefer to call it a communitarian argument. Now there are subsets of it. You could, you could see religious pronatalism here. You could see nationalism in here. Um, you could see a uh, racialist or, or um, ethnic supremacist versions of this idea. Um, but regardless, this is sort of a communitarian approach to uh, why birth rates are low is because they threaten the, the viability of a community that has some inherent value. These are both really interesting perspectives, the neoliberal and the communitarian perspective, they're both very interesting, but they both have a big problem. It's all bad news, right? So you need to have a baby because if you don't, the economy will collapse. Or you need to have a baby because if you don't, there's no future for your culture. You need to have a baby because if you don't, bad things will happen. We're gonna scare you into having more babies. The future's bad, you should fix it with a baby. That's the argument here. I don't think that's a compelling argument. Um, I, my favorite example of this actually is from Korea, where they're making uh, kind of an interesting joint argument of this, where they say um, the, the security of the country is threatened because there are not enough male children coming of age each year to fulfill the conscription needs for the military to meet what they believe is necessary for the defense of the DMZ against North Korea. Okay, so we need to have more babies so that we can have enough recruits. So what do you tell a parent? You should have a baby so we can conscript them in the to fight the opening salvos of a future nuclear war? Who has a baby for that reason? Who's like, I will have a baby so that they can die in the trenches? By the way, this argument was also made very prominently in interwar France between World War I and World War II. Um, so I see that as like emblematic of the real argument being made for both the communitarian and the neoliberal perspectives. That is, the future's bad, so you should have you should try to fix it with a baby. Okay. I obviously these are these are interesting arguments, and I want to be clear, they might be true arguments. It might be true that a community has some inherent value and should be perpetuated. It might be true that low birth rates threaten the economy. But even if they're true, they're not actually persuasive. Nobody really wants to have a baby for these reasons. So why care about birth rates? I would say is because people want babies. And this is going to be the focus of my presentation is people wanting babies, especially women wanting babies. Uh, the reason I focus on women, it's not that men don't matter, it's not that fathers are unimportant, it's first uh, that fathers um, or men often misreport their fertility history. That is, they might not know how many children they have, or they might be unwilling to accept paternity. Um, uh, they just, we find that men report these things less accurately. Um, and two, uh, because women are uh, the ones uh, generally bearing the heaviest load of of, uh, of course, gestation and then also child rearing itself. Um, the costs are going to land the most on women. And so I'm most interested in, in their preferences. Okay, so um, this is, if we take every survey that's been conducted that I know about, and I know about about 1500 surveys of fertility preferences around the world. Um, if we take all of them that have been conducted since 2000 and then average them for each country, because you know, they happen in different years, different periods. It's not like we have a global fertility survey. Um, and we ask how many 
how many children did women say they wanted to have? This shows us the average answers and I've color coded them. So reddish colors mean below two, bluish colors mean two or higher. Uh, and what you can see is that most of the world is some shade of blue or bluish gray. Almost everywhere women want two or more children. In some countries, women want a lot more than two kids. So we're talking about most of Africa and the Middle East and also Malaysia. Um, in some countries, women want, you know, two or three kids. Northern Europe, uh, most of the Americas, uh, actually most of the rich world is kind of in this two or three kids category. There are a few places where fertility preferences are below two. Italy, uh, Czechia, Austria, Romania, Malta, you can't see on here, but Malta. Um, these are places where average fertility preferences are a bit below two. And then we have the places where fertility preferences are quite a bit below two. And by places, I mean, in fact, place, and that is China. Now, there's an obvious reason why surveyed fertility preferences in China might be far below two. Because telling a survey taker during the one child policy that you want more than one child is unwise. So it'll be interesting to see if these preferences change now that the policy is being relaxed um, in China. The, the, the Chinese numbers might not be valid. Um, but regardless, what we can see is there's a lot of variety in fertility preferences. You know, there's a big difference between what French women want and Italian women. There's a big difference between what Polish women want and what Czech women want. There's a big difference between women in Thailand and women in Cambodia. Um, there's a considerable difference between women in Namibia and Angola. There's not one experience. Women in Taiwan want very different things from women in Korea. Um, there's, there's differences here. There are important culturally specific ideas, preferences, and norms around family size. So fertility preferences vary very widely. So what about fertility rates? So here what I've done is I've taken the fertility, the average birth rate in each country, um, and I've subtracted it from desires. So brown um, means that desires are higher than fertility rates. So women are probably going to end up having fewer children than they say they want. Bluish green means they're lower. So women are going to end up having more kids than they want. So there's a couple of big takeaways here. First is most of the map is brown. Okay, in most countries, women will have fewer children than they say they want. Now, look, we know this is true uh, in the US or Canada or France or Ukraine. It's also true in Niger and Chad and Afghanistan. The average Afghan girl is likely to have fewer children than she says she wants. Now, that's interesting, right? Um, that's very interesting. So most of the world is brown. Uh, some of the world is not. So uh, women in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Egypt, Bolivia, Namibia, Angola, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Malawi, Lesotho, Swaziland, Papua New Guinea, Iran, Tajikistan, and India, in those countries, and that's the complete list of countries where birth rates are higher than what women want, okay? Um, so in almost every country, women want more children than they're likely. to. But again, I want to emphasize, there's a lot of poor countries where women are already having fewer children than they say they want. So this is a rich world problem, but it's not only a rich world problem, okay? This is an important distinction. This is not only a problem of rich countries. And I think that this should change our perception of a very important thing. That is, what are the reproductive policy and support needs of women in least developed countries? Is what they need just helicopter drops of like condom and birth, condoms and birth control pills? The answer is no. A lot of these women actually wanna have more kids than they're likely to have. Now, there, there is unintended pregnancy. <laughs> There is undesired pregnancy. I'm not saying that there's no place for reproductive policy support. Um, but 
this is not the, 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 the average problem facing women in many very poor countries, in, including, and in fact, especially, I wanna point out uh, in East Africa and, uh, and West Africa. So in Central Africa, th this is, a, this is a, a more common problem. Um, and to some extent in, in some of the, the, the Muslim world. Um, and Bolivia, I should note, is, is an interesting case where there's, a, there's um, Bolivia and Peru, this problem is particularly acute among sort of the, the uh, indigenous populations. So the um, Quechua speaking populations in particular. Um, okay, so this helps explain a couple things. First, it helps explain an anomaly that has been widely noted in many like UN population policy reports. And that is that transition, fertility transition, decline in fertility rates is quite slow in Africa. Birth rates aren't falling as fast as uh, sort of our population policy experts would predict and perhaps would like. Um, and there's been a lot of arguments about why this is, oh, it's because of conflict. Oh, it's because we're not educating fast enough. Oh, it's urbanization. Well, maybe it's because these women don't want to have small families. Um, it might just be because women in these countries desire larger families and who are you to tell them that they shouldn't have them just because you think fertility transition is this universal norm that will happen in all societies. Maybe it's not. Maybe preferences are different in some places. It also tells us why more countries are becoming pronatal, that is, are adopting policies intended to raise birth rates. So Hungary, of course, is a prominent example of this, but is by no means the only one. So in official uh, submissions to the United Nations, here's the number of countries in each period that said they were trying to raise, lower, or had, have no effect on their fertility rates. What you can see is over time, the number who are trying to lower their fertility rates did rise, but particularly since 2000, We've seen no increase in that number who are trying to reduce birth rates, that is antenatal policy. And we've seen a big increase, in fact, like a doubling of the number of countries that are trying to raise their birth rates. More and more countries are becoming pronatal. Thus, it is incumbent on those of us who advise countries to do a better job of giving good advice. What's a good way to do pronatalism? Nobody wants a repeat of Kuchescu's Romania. Uh, Dr. Hudson mentioned, will China end up having birth quotas? Like this, this is, I mean, is China be going to be a country where at the same time you have birth quotas for Han Chinese women and mandatory sterilization for Uyghur women? Um, is, that the, is that the future we're looking at? Um, possibly. Um, those of us who are engaged on this issue in, in an expert fashion really need to be looking at that blue line and thinking about how can we give good advice? How can we advise policies that are effective, humane, decent, and reasonable for these countries that are facing a growing problem of low birth rates and a desire to fix it? It's not our place to tell them, ignore your voters, don't try to raise the birth rate. People are concerned about low birth rates. These policies are going to happen. Our place as experts is to say, how do you do it well? So then we get to this last really interesting question. Why do people undershoot? Without being too explicit, I think most of us realize undershooting can be fixed. For the vast majority of women, about 95% of women who are biologically fecundable, that is they can have children, in principle, you can fix the problem of not having children, right? It, it can be done. <laughs> um, so why is, is undershooting a real problem? If people were really upset about it, couldn't they fix it? Sometimes we talk about something called revealed preferences. That is, uh, um, you might say you want three kids, but you really only have one. So did you really want three kids? Or maybe that was just a flight of fancy, a castle in the air, and one is your revealed preference. So my rebuttal to this would be to ask um, those of you, particularly those of you who are married or in a relationship or have been in the past, um, do you, would you like to always be kind and polite to your spouse? Would you like to? Yes, almost all of us would like to always be kind and polite to our spouse. Can you be kind and polite to your spouse? Yes, you can. You can just choose to be kind and polite to your spouse. This is possible. 
are we in fact always kind to our spouses? No, sometimes we have a long day at work, we come home, we're grumpy, and our spouse asks us a, asks us a question and we respond irritably, right? Does that mean we don't really want to be kind to our spouse? Does that mean we have a revealed preference for being a jerk to people we love? No, it doesn't. It just means that people's final behaviors are not always a measure of their true preferences. Stated preferences can be a valid measure of true preferences if they're statistically predicted. And what we do know is if you ask women when they're 15, how many kids do you wanna have? That number is highly predictive of how many children they will end up having. Particularly if you add one more control variable, that is the number of years they spend married. Those two variables together predict an enormous share of variation in fertility behaviors. So why do people undershoot? What I wanna argue is it's not because these preferences are fake. It's not because they're weakly held. I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but these, pre these preferences are real. They're not fake preferences. So the reasons they undershoot is first, cost. And what I mean is when people have a child, they usually want that child to live. That is, they, they wanna have access to you know, health and nutrition for the child. They, they, don't, they don't want to have the child experience early mortality. Um, but not just live, they usually want their child to live a good life. This is reasonable. This isn't like saying everybody wants to own a personal yacht. Saying everybody should be able to have, you know, one, two, maybe three kids, and they should be able to live a decent, safe, healthy life. This is not unreasonable. So costs is a way of saying that the cost of stuff like childcare, education, housing, clothing, food has changed over time. Some things have gotten cheaper. For example, food and clothing have mostly gotten cheaper over the last 30 years as manufacturing improves. But anything requiring human labor, like education, childcare, things like that, has gotten more and more expensive as productivity has not risen as quickly in those fields. This is something called Baumol's cost disease for Khalid the economist syndrome. Um, so costs of childcare, uh, costs of child rearing have risen. Direct financial costs, there's a budget problem. But another issue is opportunity costs. What you give up to have children has changed. So uh, as wages rise, Children distract you from the workplace and your wages will suffer. This is true no matter the policy environment. In Sweden, where they have generous maternity leave and job sharing and work security and all these things, there's a huge wage penalty for having kids. That's true in America too, where we have virtually no protection. Um, the, the main determiners of the, the wage and income losses of childbearing um, are, are not policy structural, they're cultural and attitude. Um, they're norms about who should care for children and how should you provide childcare. Um, but there's other opportunity costs too. My favorite one is the fastest growing industry in the world over the last 30 years, and that is tourism and recreation. And why has it grown so fast? Well, we've got globalization, travel's gotten cheaper, airplanes have gotten cheaper, visas have opened up in many countries, more and more countries are getting wealthy enough to be able to provide good, safe, secure travel environments. The ability to plan trips has gotten easier with internet access to things and websites like Kayak, and you can see your friend on Instagram posting about this cool place they went, you go, oh, I wanna go there, and you get a better idea of where you want to go, and so travel is booming. Every airport in the world is always crowded, except during COVID, obviously, but pre-COVID, and now, once again, after, um, this is a huge booming area. What happened? Well, travel got cheaper and easier. It just did. And so even if the cost of childbearing is the same, the money you spend on child, on child rearing and the time you spend on child rearing could be used on something else. And if the appeal of those other something else's and if the cost of them changes too, then that matters. So even if people really want three kids, if we as a society say, we're not gonna help you anymore, we're not gonna provide any extra help for kids, but we are gonna make it cheaper and easier to do all these non-kid things, well, people will do more non-kid stuff. That doesn't mean the preference for children is fake. It means that we as a society structurally chose through our econo economic and political structures to reward non-child rearing. And a final reason is beliefs. Um, 
there are a lot of surveys about when people think it's harder to have kids. And the average person in developed countries believes that their fertility, that, that in particular women's fertility, uh, begins to decline in the late 30s, but IVF can offset it. And as you know, and with IVF, you can have kids while you're born. That's what, that's what the average person believes. This is false. The average woman's fertility begins to decline in her late 20s. It goes into severe decline in the mid 30s. IVF can offset this, but right now IVF technologies only add on average about two or three years to your reproductive time. This is not what most people believe. And in experimental studies, if you ask people their beliefs, then inform them true facts about fertility, then survey their beliefs again, on average, they report desiring to have children younger. People have wrong beliefs about the difficulty of having children. They underestimate the frequency of miscarriage. They overestimate how easy it is to conceive. They overestimate, and, and they incorrectly estimate the age at which fertil conception becomes more difficult. People have wrong beliefs about fertility. It can be corrected through just basic science education. So this is why people undershoot. Costs, opportunity, costs, and wrong beliefs. So that's uh, my, my talk here. I'm, um, I'm three minutes over uh, and uh, didn't, didn't even jump into kind of the policy analysis side, but we can, uh, we can do the, um, uh, I guess it's Q&A now, right? Yes, it is Q&A now. Um, I needed to unmute myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lyman. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, as is my tradition, as people who have been, been here for a while when I've been moderating these has, have, have learned, I like to ask the first question as kind of a moderator's privilege. Um, and this is one that actually touches on both of your remarks, but it kind of was sparked by um, Lyman, your idea of one of the reasons for the low birth rate being bad was kind of this communitarian, sorry, um, idea of, of trying to like perpetuate your, your society, right? Um, and so my question is with the low birth rates in certain parts of the world and with the high birth rates in other parts of the world, what kind of a factor does immigration and immigration policy, how, how are the low birth rates factoring into immigration policies in different countries, if you, if you know this, right? Um, you know, because there's a desire to raise the birth rates um, to like say, make more Australians, right? But they could also choose to import Australians, if you will. Um, so what kind of effect is this having on immigration and immigration policy? Um, would be my first question um, for both of you. And while you're thinking for a second, um, we had one question in the chat from Siobhan, which I also thought was very interesting about do women's reported preferences change after having their first child? So again, um, Lyman, you talked about how if you asked a girl when she's 15, how many children is she gonna have, that that tends to predict how many children she's gonna have. Um, but how do things change once they have their first kid, once they've started a career, once they realize how difficult it is maybe to be a working mother, et cetera? Um, how, how does that shift with each successive child? Um, so maybe uh, because Lyman was the last person to talk, maybe if, if Dr. Hudson, if you have any thoughts about either one of those two questions, um, we'll turn the time over to you first. Meanwhile, anybody else can pose questions in the chat. Well, yes, immigration policy and um, pro or antinatalism tend to be policies that are linked. I mean, a, a perfect example of this is Hungary. And we heard from the ambassador uh, from Hungary um, at the beginning of our event. Uh, Hungary has uh, married anti-immigration policies with strong pro-natalist policies for the very reasons that you're discussing. Uh, and yes, it is, it is definitely true, at least in the United States, that we do a lot of economic planning that is 
based around not just fertility rates, but immigration rates um, as well. Um, and so I think how each country um, links those two um, is different, right? It, we have uh, different policy responses. Um, but the, you know, the one that I see as increasing over time is the Hungarian marriage of anti-immigration policies with strong pronatalism. But I think you see a wide mix. Uh, I think the second one was about um, changes in desire for children after the first child. I think that's a, a wonderful research question. I myself have not seen any research on that, um, but uh, I do think it's important that we, um, uh, we look at all the many reasons why um, stated desire for child for for a child may be influenced by other types of um, things. Um, I think Lyman was trying to get at this in his presentation, but um, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, especially the nations that were highlighted on the map, um, it, it's also true that women have virtually no structural power in marriage and a man standing in his community is based upon the number of children he sires. So in many of these countries, women can be told and we know that they are told that unless they have the number of children that the man would like, that they will either be divorced or the husband will marry polygonously. So I think there's you know, reasons that we need to look at each country and see whether the, the women's preferences are in fact being um, molded by the men's preferences in, um, in certain cultures. So uh, you have to dig into those figures on a country by country basis, sometimes on a subnational population by subnational population basis before any sweeping um, statements can be made. Thank you. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, I have a little uh, chart that I like to use, uh, um, particularly I try to use it to explain different kinds of pronatalism to journalists. Um, where you can kind of chart out all the different types of pronatalism. There's about 12 out there um, based on the kinds of arguments they make, the kinds of concerns they have. Um, but if you think broadly about the, the three categories I gave, these big categories, sort of the neoliberal, communitarian, and individualist perspectives. Um, for the neoliberal perspective, immigration can be a solution. Um, right, that low birth rates are a problem because they basically, uh, alter the population structure in a problematic way, um, immigrants can solve that, right? They can, they can fix that. Um, now there are versions of kind of this uh, kind of liberal collectivist uh, perspective or neoliberal perspective that, uh, that would have some concerns about immigration. For example, some arguments in this uh, area would say um, the reason low birth rates are a problem is because um, low population growth of the local population creates uh, greater susceptibility to politics of paranoia and fear, which erodes social trust and threatens institutions and ultimately kills the, gold, the goose the golden, that lays the golden egg, that is liberal democracy. Um, and so bringing in immigrants doesn't solve that problem, right? So this is still basically kind of this um, uh, universalizing um, economic argument at the end, at, at the, several links down the chain, but immigration doesn't directly solve that. It could make it worse. But most of these kind of neoliberal arguments, immigration can substitute for, for babies. If you, think, if you think about the communitarian arguments, not only does immigration not solve the problem, it is the problem, right? Um, or at least it can be. So, um, uh, you know, in our present political debates, this can get very contentious. So I'd like to go to a different example. Um, and say, um, uh, you know, if you are uh, an Algonquian Indian, Native American, First Nation, take your pick of term, in America in the 1600s, um, is immigration of Puritans from England a threat to your society? Um, 
Well, yes, we know that historically it is. Um, uh, it is. Um, even if they come in peace, right? Even if they are not actively killing you, they're still laying the groundwork for ultimately a, a change in the, the population stock that, that dominates this territory. Um, so um, uh, for the communitarian argument, if you say this community has inherent value and it is worth perpetuating, immigration can ipso facto be a, a problem. And it certainly doesn't fix the low birth rate problem unless immigrants can actually be assimilated. So for example, I live in Quebec, um, where in principle, uh, Quebecois identity is not about genetic tie to the founding stock, but is about Canadian francophonie, right? So you, you can become Quebecois, um, even though there's a strong sense of uh, the importance of perpetuating the community, that is, uh, Canadian francophonie. Um, so, uh, um, uh, you can also think of this in a religious community, right? Maybe immigrants are a threat to a religious community, or maybe they're a source of potential converts. Um, but for an ethno-national community, which is the level we make policy at, um, immigration is, is, is often going to be rivalrous with births. However, if you have an ideal of civic nationalism, like in the U.S., that has a story about immigration baked into it, then immigration might be complementary with births. So the, on the communitarian side, it's complicated, but often immigration is problematic for communitarian pronatalists. For, for individualist pronatalists, that is those of us who would argue that preferences are the reasons to, reason to care, um, immigration is just irrelevant. You know, you can let in zero immigrants or a gajillion immigrants, it doesn't change the average number of babies that a person has. Um, the, the macro social consequence is irrelevant for the individualist argument, right? Um, so that, that's where immigration fits in. Um, on the question of changing fertility preferences, uh, they do change. Um, fertility preferences are notoriously unstable. Um, that is for a, for a large share of women, they bounce around. Um, but they are nonetheless highly predictive. And I know that that does sound contradictory, but they're not because often what you see is a woman who said she wanted six, now wants four, and she ends up with three or four, which is above average. Um, or you see a woman who wanted zero and now she wants one or she wanted one and now she wants zero. That is, she had below average preferences in both cases. Um, so a lot of the volatility is kind of irrelevant for um, predicting actual margins. Um, and secondarily, the volatility um, uh, it just, it doesn't, while there is a lot of volatility, there are people who are stable. Um, after people have kids, they do change their preferences. They tend to change them upwards. Um, after people age, they also change their preferences downwards. As you get older, you tend to rationalize kids you don't have. So you start, you start to say, well, I think, you know, maybe I used to want four, but I've only had two. And now I realize really three is what I would be happiest with. That is you rationalize away the kids that you didn't have as you get older on average. On the other hand, people also tend to rationalize upwards the kids they did have. Very few people say they want one kid then have the second, then tell that kid every day of their life, I really didn't want you, right? That's uncommon. Um, so um, we do see that people, uh, there's debate on how to interpret this. Is it rationalization? Is it learning? Is it discovery? Um, but yeah, preferences change, but they're still highly predictive. Um, I, I'm sensitive to the argument that uh, Dr. Hudson made that um, uh, the things that influence preferences are not always values neutral. That is, if, every, if a lot of women say they want eight kids, um, and what they really mean is if I don't have eight kids, I'll be divorced and destitute because I live in a patriarchal society that's you know, treating me unequally. I mean, that is problematic, that's, that's concerning. On the other hand, this argument kind of is, is paternalistic on its own, right? The idea that we can look at these women and decide if they're truly free. Um, that is that, that we are the proper judges of the correct baseline for their freedom. Um, now, in some cases, it's pretty clear, right? If you see that like these women have severe mortality risks, if they like deviate from husband's preferences, this is fairly objective. Okay, 
this isn't the most, this isn't the median case. I mean, the average woman in Nigeria is not um, living, you know, without access to any kind of modern liberal society in the hinterland, right? She's an urban woman in Lagos who's basically exposed to global culture, um, which is why she doesn't on average prefer eight kids, she needs about three. Um, characterizing this woman is necessarily subordinated um, is I would argue an imposition of the values of a very small subset of people that is relatively wealthy Westerners on what may be a culture that goes in a different way. Now I know she's going to disagree with me, which is fine, but I would argue uh, and many advocates- I think we need to talk about CEDAW, which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. That has a, a 184 signatories that have signed on to a basic level of human rights that are provided to women. And guess what? They've actually created indices, which you would consider empirical, that will allow us to compare the level of free choice available to a woman in Niger versus a woman in Nigeria versus a woman in Denmark. So I think this is a very specious and a very um, unhelpful uh, argument when you're suggesting that there are universal human rights that may apply to men, but they're not universal human rights that apply to women, and that we're somehow paternalistic in suggesting that there is a benchmark by which we could measure these kinds of things. I don't think I suggested that there are universal human rights occurring to men, but not women. However, I'd argue that an indice, indices of what experts judge the rights of another group of people to be is, is not an empirical me measurement. What is an empirical measurement would be something like the rate of unintended pregnancy. What share of births- We can talk are, about the age of first marriage. We can talk yeah, about a lot so, of things that have right, things right. to do with human so, so, rights that so, are so, elaborated in the convention on the elimination of so, all forms of discrimination against women. So let's so, not bandy so, words, Lyman, which is that there are in fact ways to ascertain whether fundamental human rights apply to both men and women in the countries that we're discussing, and that it is not simply a cultural matter, but under universal human rights law, they actually be human rights violations. And in other cases may in fact count as crimes against humanity for which people can be brought up against the ICC. So please don't play around with human rights for women as being something that is so subjective that can, we cannot even examine these types of things because that's wrong and it's offensive. To be clear, I'm not arguing that, that there are not universal human rights that are enforceable. There, there clearly are. What I'm arguing is that when someone says they want four children, we should not assume that just because they live in a patriarchal society, that their preference is invalid and we can act like- No it's one's not. assuming. What you Broke? should do is do empirical investigation, so which like is possible. Yes, it is. And which and so I've done. Is a large study conducted by The Lancet about two years ago that looked at rates of unintended pregnancy in every data source we have around the world. And what they found is the share of pregnancies which are undesired by the mothers is about the same in Sub-Saharan Africa as in Western Europe, okay? In fact, the reproductive regime that we observe in the quote, more developed countries is not more successful at enabling women to, uh, to have control of their reproduction than the one that we observe in quote, less developed countries. Now. That doesn't well, mean it's Lemon, okay. I disagree with you there because there are strong structural reasons to believe that we must dig more deeply into some of these cultural practices, such as age of first marriage, forced marriage, polygyny, and others, which then alter the meaning of the term unintended. Certainly things can be intended but not freely chosen. And the Lancet article did not examine those things. So I do not believe that that is, is ex extraordinarily pertinent to this argument here. You're right that intentionality is not the same as desirability. 
So for example, there's a lot of research on intentionality and asking are, are unintended births unhappy births? And the answer is no. There's a lot of intended births that lead to women reporting less happiness. And there's a lot of unintended births that lead to women reporting more happiness. So you're absolutely right that there are differences in these things. But what I'm attempting to do is precisely to engage in that empirical debate, but to consider that although it could be that there are circumstances where women's preferences represent sort of uh, sublimated coercion, there may be cases of that, that should not be our first presumption. Our first presumption should be that when people vote, that is when they express their preferences, that those are valid and at least somewhat authoritative. When a woman says, I want four kids, my first assumption should be she wants four kids, not she has no freedom and her husband is forcing her to say this. Nobody's That's making first assumptions that contradict that. What we're saying is you need additional empirical investigation because we know that women are under severe structural pressure. I would like to introduce you to a book that I recently wrote called The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide, which is an empirical investigation. And we have a number of different women in the book saying that I was forced to give birth to nine children because I had eight daughters. And with each successive pregnancy, my in-laws wanted a son. I did not want nine children, but here I am with nine children. So Lyman, I think they're an on balance. We need to look at both. We assume a woman is telling the truth, but we also know that there are many, many structural reasons under which her life can be made absolutely miserable if she is not bearing the number and the sex of the children that is wanted in her marriage. So we have to acknowledge both and we have to look at both. So there must be first assumption and there must be second empirical investigation. I agree that we should look at both and assess both. And we should open up for more questions here. But I'll yeah. make my last comment on this. We should look at both and assess both. And a great example of that is, for example, in the Millennium Development Goals, we should probably include some reference to women's stated preferences. Currently, we don't. So I would argue the current state of things is that we ignore women's preferences in any kind of assessment of reproductive policies. I you must see this, uh, are, are you talking about the sustainable development goals? Because the sustainable development goals are what we're, we're look, working on now. The millennium development goals um, so were in the past. Right. And now, we, now we have the SDGs. But the point is, at present, fertility preferences are not an evaluative criteria in any of these. So, Probably because they need to be married with empirical investigation, and perhaps folks copped out of doing that. But definitely, there are empirical analyses out there, and I and I believe that this is not something that is out of reach. So we have about five minutes left. So I want to ask one more question to kind of like bring a couple of questions together. There was a there was a couple of questions in the chat that focused on different demographic trends. One of them was the rise of, of LGBT relationships um, and how that might affect population growth and population and birth rates. Um, and the other one was the rise of women's education, right? And how that might affect. So with more women going to college and pursuing graduate degrees, et cetera, how is that going to affect birth rates? And I think that latter one is actually particularly relevant to Dr. Hudson um, because she is a Dr. Hudson. She does have her PhD and she also has six kids. Um, so obviously her graduate degrees did not stop her from having children. Um, so those two things, LGBT rates and, uh, and women's education, how have those affected birth rates? Education deeply affects birth rates and does so both mechanically and it does so through uh, alteration of um, of desires, if you will, the shaping of desires. It does so mechanically um, because still in most of the world, if you do get pregnant, uh, heck, if you are married, you are no longer entitled to go to school. And so for many women, um, you know, those who, who desire and are able to go on for education are actually in a sense uh, forbidden. Uh, to marry and to have children. In fact, I met a number of women in the United Arab Emirates 
who had actually used this with their families as a way to delay marriage, which is virtually always arranged in the Emirates. They could delay this by saying that they wish to go on for university education. So in, in a very sort of mechanical way, yes, you decrease the birth rate by increasing the number of years that women are in school. But it is also true then that education opens doors to a, you know, a, a possibly different conception of life. And certainly uh, the neoliberal approach is that one's uh, primary contribution uh, to the world is not in the form of children, um, but in the form of some type of uh, work contribution, a contribution through your work. It is also true that the, you know, the modern workplace is by and large a very hostile place to anyone that wishes to combine maternity with having children. Notice I didn't say paternity. You're actually rewarded in most workplaces if you're a father, and, uh, but you are punished uh, in the workplace for attempting to become um, a mother. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that, as Ryan noted, I did choose academia. I actually have eight children. And it was only through an unusual type of employment that I was able to have as many children as I wanted uh, and also be successful in my career. Um, so yes, the shaping of the workplace, the shaping of the concept of what is a contribution that one makes with one's life, as well as the mechanical postponement of uh, marriage and childbearing um, all mean that um, higher education rates for women are often associated with lower birth rates. We see this in Saudi Arabia. We see this in the Gulf countries, all of which have sub-replacement birth rates now. Uh, but also have uh, increasingly um, many women educated at the tertiary level. Yeah, I know that we're just about out of time. I'll, I'll be very we brief have, here. On we haven't got one minute. Yeah, so um, there's a great study in Nepal called the Chitwan Valley uh, Survey Project, I think, um, where they've got complete longitudinal contextual data for this community from its first settlement to the present it's, it's incredible data. And so they were able to look at what happens when a new school opens in a neighborhood. What they found is the girls who go to that school don't have a big change in their fertility desires. Getting educated doesn't necessarily have a big impact on fertility preferences in this longitudinal, highly contextual, extremely detailed data. Um, it has it's some impact, but not a lot. Um, the, the big impact uh, is just living close to the school, okay? That is the effective education works primarily not through the person who gets educated, but the wider contextual cultural effect of exposure to education as a concept and, and, and education um, and particularly Western education. Um, and I would argue this is really interesting. First of all, it suggests that the effect of education is not only through things we would universally agree are sort of liberatory, that is greater choice, greater control of economic resources, things like this, which that is a real effect. It is there. That's wonderful. But also through things that are values laden and neither liberatory nor not liberatory, right? It's that education increases the odds that you listen to Katy Perry. That might be fine, but that's like, who cares? That's not like essential to human rights that you do or don't listen to Katy Perry, right? Um, so cultural changes are important, even apart from these structural changes. And I want to link this to that last question on LGBT, LGBT identity. Um, right now, large population shares being identifying as uh, non uh, cisgendered heterosexual is mostly confined to Western Europe, North America, and a few Pacific Rim countries. Whether that will remain the case is an interesting question. Um, data on LGBT fertility is very spotty. It does appear that um, uh, natal females who do not identi identify as cisgendered heterosexuals, excuse me, heterosexuals have lower birth rates. It's difficult to measure for a variety of reasons. If this subset of the population grows rapidly and particularly spreads beyond its current geographic uh, region. And particularly if it's, if it's uh, increasing as a result of like cultural change and cultural exposure, 
um, that could have significant fertility impacts down the line. Right now, the effect has been pretty modest thus far. Um, it's, it's not a major driver yet. It could become one in some future. Okay, and with that, we do need to end today. Um, but thank you both very much. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Stone, for taking time out of your busy schedules to speak with us. We really appreciate both the information that you presented and the discussion that we had afterwards. Um, we really appreciate it. For all of you uh, participants, our next meeting will be November 18th. We're looking forward to that. We'll send out more information via email. Um, and until then, have a great rest of your afternoon and a great weekend and a great Halloween weekend. Um, thank you once again to both of you for, for everything today.